Welcome to Diadem Life Arise today. We got an awesome show for you. Today, we're going to be talking about how to pray and why to pray. But I got to tell you something. There's something coming up pretty soon. Did you know Jesus got mad? He got mad a few times. We rarely see it. And we don't want Jesus angry. So we're going to learn about that. We're going to learn about prayer. Your life is going to change. You are the hero of your story. So my, my best way to help as a biblically-based life guide is to bring you the best. And I'm not just bringing you soulful preaching. I'm not just trying to share my soul and how awesome my understanding is. A lot of preachers can project how cool they are. And, you know, some of them are cool. We should learn from other people. But it's in your best interest if you know the stories that God highlights in the scriptures. We got plenty of that for you today. Now, a part of talking about prayer, this is foundational, basic Christianity. When you get down to the very, very core, you need three things to grow in your relationship to God. You're going to need the Bible because you got to hear what God says. You're going to pray and you're going to have relationships with other Christians. And that relationship thing's going to church, right? We're going to meet people there. Well, what is church? Is it online or such and such? Well, we've already discussed that on a previous episode. But the point is, Prayer, it's in that that nucleus, that foundation. And prayer is really important because if you're if you're praying for something, but you can't see it anywhere in the Bible, that's a clue. You might be outside of God's will. The, the Bible is a solid foundation to build your life upon. So if you can't see it in the Bible, you, you gotta wonder. But then again, you know, texting wasn't in the Bible, social media wasn't in the Bible. So we've got this dynamic life of faith. And we're going to learn, and we really want to We want to learn. And let me tell you, there's only a few places we see Jesus get, uh, I'm going to call him Mad Jesus. Uh, I'll tell you what, what we mean here shortly. I want to give you an epic update. The merch store is open, diademlife.store. Go on and buy your merch now and support the mission and vision and use these the, the emblem and the logo just to get people talking and talk to them. Share these messages and scriptures. It'll change lives. Thank you for your support at diademlife.store. We also have diadem.life, the website. I want to share a funny story with you. I recently went to a Bible study about prayer, and guess what we did about for a whole hour? We talked about it. I know that might have went over some of your head, but when you go to talk about prayer, talking about prayer ain't praying. But I'll tell you what, for this one, we're going to talk about it, and then we're going we're gonna to do some exercises. It, we'll, we're going to get into prayer. We're not going to just talk about it. We are going to lay a teaching foundation to help get you past any hurdles you might have. Now, some people get all intimidated, and I get some people are probably um, less uh, wanting to share publicly, and that, that's understandable. And a lot of people that maybe are new to God, they, they don't feel comfortable talking to God. They might feel like they're talking out to the air. Totally understandable. What you need to realize is prayer is simply talking. So if you want to grow your prayer life, you're going to grow your communication with God. Now, to just make it quite simple, I personally, I have children and a wife. So when I come home, I say hello and I, I say their name. I say, hi, son. How are you doing? Okay, it, it's that simple to talk with God, but you got to start. When you're going to take your prayer time, you acknowledge God and talk to him. It can be that easy. So I want to tell you one thing because prayer is important, and I, I, I wish every prayer was answered instantaneously, but then we wouldn't have our God would be like a genie in the bottle, a wish maker. And to be honest, life would be strange if instantaneously every prayer was answered. Could you imagine that? Billions of people praying, I want food, and then food just shows up. Life as we know it, it wouldn't even have like a bunch of the laws of physics and stuff. So what we're going to do today is we're going to learn how to pray effectively and this is going to be awesome. And I want to give you one testimony about an answered prayer. I, I've got many of them, and this is one that's real light. I was a younger man, and my, 
I my parents were very very kind and loving and uh we didn't like go to church and pray together a lot. We might have said the Lord's prayer at grace for dinner. But I I remember one day I'm like I want to pray with my mom. Well, our cat ran away. And the the cat's name was Wiley and it it ran away and it was a house cat. It's declawed and hey, up north you got raccoons and stuff. This isn't good for a house pet. And I, I use this as the first time in a considerable time that I remember saying, Mom, can we pray for the cat? And, and I thought, God, man, you're using this cat to get us to pray together, so let's do it. And I prayed. And let me tell you what. Nine days later. Now, do you know how long nine days later is? It's a long time for a house cat. It's kind of like, hey, I prayed. I don't know if it got answered, but I don't know if I'll ever know. But, uh, you know, somewhere between eight and nine days, the neighbor called, and it was under their deck. And that was kind of interesting. So you got this kind of overweight house cat. Well, yeah, it lost a few pounds. It was scared. And I tell you what, when it saw the front door, it never ran that way again. And so it learned a lesson, and I got to pray with my mom. And look... We're talking about a found cat, and that might not really touch you. You've got lives going on. You got you got relationships with your spouse. You got job promotions you want. You might want to get hired or 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 to maybe not lose a job. There's some serious things. Sometimes if you have children like me, they might be sick and you're praying. Uh, some of our prayers need to rise up way past a lost pet, even, and if you love pets, maybe that's the biggest thing going on for you. We're going to talk about this, and this this prayer life is key to your your relationship with God. I have had the privilege of following God for over twenty years. I'm going to share with you the best scriptures. These things are so tried and true and proven. If there was a list of the top 100 scriptures, I mean, they'd, they'd be there. So these aren't obscure passages. I, I know that you're going to appreciate this. But now, as we said earlier, Jesus getting mad here. Let's go ahead and read it. Let's go read it right now. Mark 11, 15 through 17. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the table of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves." This is interesting now. Uh, We always think he's nice and kind and loving, and almost all of the scripture is. He got mad, and he would rebuke a few Pharisees, and he would do it sharply. Sometimes we see that he got mad with religious leaders that actually were misrepresenting God's good intention for you. So let's find out this one. Why was he so mad? Well, he described it right there in the scriptures he began to drive people out by selling, for selling animals for sacrifices. So back in the day, you had to sacrifice animals, whether it was a pigeon or a goat or a sheep, what, whatever the sacrifice required, they turned it into a marketplace. Now they had a specific, what we would call a church, but they, would, they called the temple. Jesus was upset that the temple of God, the place where people were supposed to meet, the the institution and the geographic place that was supposed to represent God and and everything he wants to do for humanity, it just got turned into like a mall where you would go buy food and buy the things you need. Can you imagine this? I know we're reading the scripture in a paragraph, but just try to imagine this. Jesus goes to a place, there's animals, there's people buying and selling animals, there are money changers, there's people that have doves. It's also a religious place, right? So you would imagine people are there praying, right? And there's priest-type people, Pharisees and such. They're there running the temple, and don't you think they, they probably have a staff? 
He was an influential, influential guy. He healed many people. What if 200 people came with him? So it, we don't know how many people were there. Let's say there's 200 people there. The man walks into the temple, and we respect Jesus as the Son of God. We, we have that privilege looking into history and knowing what's going on. But think in the, the mind of the people that day. They didn't quite know what was going on yet. He's saying things people have never heard. And you know the priests, they, they eat, sleep, and breathe temple worship and talking to the people about the temple. So spiritually, he had um, authority to be there. When I use the key to get into my house, it's my house. I walk in like a boss. It's my house. Yes, it's also my wife and my children, but I have no reservation at all walking in. So when he's walking into this, the, the synagogue, the temple, um, he's walking in with the love of his father, but guess what? Other people don't think it's his. Could you imagine um, driving out people selling the animals? Hey, get these out of here. Money changers. I, I would imagine there was currencies from multiple languages on tables, and he's, he's flipping over the tables. Hello, the money's on the table. Money's falling on the ground. I would imagine this, this was the side of Jesus that it wasn't calm. It, and by the way, you might think this isn't polite. It might be the politest thing to do when, when God's religion is turning into a mockery and they've just made it a part of the public square where it's business as usual. It made the religious leaders mad, but then he taught the people, and everybody gets amazed when Jesus talks, because when he says it, you have to consider what he's saying. And if you consider it religiously, he has understanding beyond his years. He has understanding beyond, um, I guess, what is socially acceptable. So he says, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. So we know prayer is super important to God. We know that even when God sent Jesus, Jesus is going to the temple and he's pointing everybody out. Look, I, I appreciate you want to buy and sell somewhere. You don't come to this place with this special place with God and treat it like it's common. So there's Jesus. We don't want Jesus mad. We appreciate Jesus. Um, so let's, let's learn from, okay, so what is prayer? Let's, let's start diving into that. Let's go to one part of Luke 6, 12. One day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray and he prayed to God all night. Wow. You serious? What is night? Is it from 10 p.m. till, till sunrise at 6 a.m.? Is that eight hours? What do you think he prayed for eight hours? That, there, there's a lot going on there. Well, let's read the next scripture. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names. The next scripture lists all their names. So we don't really know how many people are with him. We, we know they're disciples, right? And that, But we do know there's 12 apostles. So at least a group of 12 plus a few more, right? I don't know. What if there was 50, 70, whatever it was, I, I think a part of his eight hours in prayer, at least a part of it, I've got to make some big decisions tomorrow. I'm going to pick 12 apostles. That's a big decision. And maybe you have a big decision in life. What career am I going to have? Somebody's doing something at work and I either need to be quiet and, and hurt my conscience or I should report this up the chain of command, talk to my boss. My wife or spouse is mad at me for such and such. Am I going to change or not? Sometimes we've got gripping life issues. And we, we're not just assuming. We, we can, with, with a, a strong certainty, we know Christ was thoughtful and prayerful about his daily decisions. So we'd see him doing that in the all night thing. It's not fun to be tired. But there was something about the heart of, of Jesus he wanted to know God. And how are you going to know anybody or anything if you don't spend time? So he spent time. I want to read a scripture for you that 
it's it's just so blessing. So let's go ahead and read Proverbs 4, 23. This scripture is so good. I put it in all three versions so we could dive into some of the nuances of how great the scripture is. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. That's awesome. Your heart determines a lot of your outcome. A part of what you're dealing with right now is related to things in your heart. That may be hard to settle in. You may be thinking, well, I didn't deserve such and such at work. I, I don't deserve the, the economy's affected me. Uh, society's affected me. Some things are related to what's in your heart. Your heart pulls you towards things. It, it helps create desires and motives, right? When we have a desire and a motive and we're thinking about it and we're feeling it, eventually we start putting actions. So this scripture is just telling you how important your heart is. Prayer is going to help your heart. This is going to change your life. If you can focus till the end of the teaching, you're going to have so much that you've learned from this. And your, your life will change. Let's go into the NIV version. It says, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. I love that word wellspring. Uh, technically, I, I, I think it's just two words put together. I don't know what a wellspring is, but just think about spring of life, all that is well within your soul. Your heart is just going to be putting forth a good stream. We need that because life on earth is not very fun, is it? Nuclear superpowers are not happy with each other. What do you think that means for us? Seven billion people on the planet, three nuclear superpowers have enough nukes to take out the earth. We need a whole lot of a wellspring of life coming out of our heart. We need it in many nations. Let's go to Proverbs in the 423 AMP. Keep and guard your heart with all vigilance. Okay, that's, that's what I want to do, that. Vigilance, look, if, if there's a physical threat coming to take out your family, I mean, some things could hit us when we're not looking, but if it was going to come, ideally you'd want to stand in front of that threat and neutralize it. We've got to guard our heart with all vigilance. This is not a passive thing. You don't just take a nap and casually wake up. You wake up and you think, man, my heart, it, it has passions and motives. I need to be careful what's in there. I got to be careful what I see, what I hear, what I say. Because if, if I injure my heart, don't be surprised if life changes and there's some consequences that we're not proud of. I can't imagine how many people who've ever been arrested, or maybe even served jail or prison time, a lot of these people don't appreciate what they did. We got to protect our heart from going down the evil path. And don't think you're so proud like it can't happen to you. If you read the atrocities from World War II, you'll find a lot of common people who didn't like what was going on, but they just kept their mouth shut. They worried about themselves. But Jesus, he's impacting our hearts, souls, and minds, and he's focused on a message of love. So Jesus has a vested interest in talking to you and, and giving you the best love he has. And we can see in Scripture, he wants to, we're being taught to guard our heart. Okay, we're going to be vigilant. We're going to come against things attacking us. But we're going to talk more about having a good heart and, and how prayer is going to help us. It's always important to interpret Scripture with Scripture. So let's go ahead and read one more Scripture. Now, I've got this here because this is the number one commandment Jesus talked about. He was asked, what's the number one? He said this, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And second is equally important, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So the reason why we're talking about this, if Jesus tells us what's the most important thing, I'm just going to take a guess, and I'm a very simple man. I think this could probably apply to almost every single biblical teaching or principle. If you listen to anything from any preacher in the Bible, 
you should probably be able to pull this scripture out and see what they're saying. There should be a way to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, to take care of yourself and to take others in, in the sense of loving them within a biblical context. This is important. We're going to think about that as we talk about prayer. So before we go to the next scripture, um, there was a practice back in the day when people would pray out in public. They would, um, I, I don't have the, all the history on that, but could you imagine somebody holding their arms up in public? Oh God, help these sinners, help us all, help us all. So they're, they're launching off into public discussion, but it's really just prayer, right? All right, so let's see what Jesus has to say in Matthew 6, 5. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everybody can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, Go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need before you ask Him. So one of the things we've learned about this is, is prayer is not designed to be a public spectacle when you're just praying privately to God, but just so people can watch you. So then you might say like, oh, when there's like a presidential election and there's like an inauguration day, there's, there's usually somebody who prays over the presidency. Well, that's a public prayer. Yes, that is not somebody out there just standing with their prayer time. They are praying corporately for a person. The, the same thing, maybe you might be wondering, well, if Jesus is telling me I should pray in secret, sh some people customarily pray before they have dinner in a restaurant. Okay, if you just stand up and close your eyes and just have your five-minute prayer time so people can see you, that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about a conscientious moment of praying to God in public. Should you pray with your wife? Well, we interpret Scripture with Scripture. You're, the Bible says the two become one flesh in marriage. So yeah, there should be times you pray with your spouse. And you know what? If there's times where you want to pray by yourself, there's probably some mutually um, beneficial reasons why you should spend time with God outside of your spouse. God bless our spouses, but sometimes we need to really focus on our relationship with the Lord. Now, should we pray with others? There are many scriptures in the Bible that talk about praying with others. I, I didn't list a bunch right in here, but here's what we know. It's not a goofy carnival act that we do in public just so people can see us. Okay, so now we know what it's not. And I want to, Jesus is going to tell a story about what it is. Now, these are red letters. These are words that came out of Jesus' mouth. Now, I appreciate the whole Bible, but when I see red letters, I'm listening. There's a lot of great men in God, men of God and women of God. There's a lot of awesome historical things going on. But I tell you, if I saw Jesus talking in the room, I, I would have to excuse the person talking to me. Hold on, man. Let me hear. Let me hear what he's saying. These are red letters. Let's go see what he says in red letters. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. Time out. I want to pause right here. The Pharisee is an awesome religious leader. You know, any, have you ever heard of, you know, people go to school for years, they graduate, you know, police, fire, EMS, you got to go through these academies or whatever. These guys were top shelf, um, expert trained. They live by the law. They, they walk out what they, they believe they are publicly held accountable to their great spiritual prowess, if you want to call it that. So all, the other is a despised tax collector. We're going to talk about a despised tax collector. If you're not familiar, when Rome invaded and occupied, they wanted to tax the, the Jewish people. 
So if there was a Jewish person, sometimes they would make them the tax collector. Well, guess what? That person knows the languages. He knows where people are going. If they're telling the truth, oh, I only have uh, $100 to my name. Oh, really? I know where your business is and where your money is. So can you see how the Jewish tax collector working for the Romans, they're not just the enemy. They're helping the enemy penetrate all your privacy and your trust and your loyalty. Uh, it's a good thing to care for your nation, but when you're actively working to destroy your nation, don't be surprised if people from your nation call you despised. All right, so here's the story. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like the other people, the cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. Okay, so that's the Pharisee's prayer. Now, in verse 13, here we go. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you the truth, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So we see a few things here. The, the proud man was just so happy, and he judged his relationship with God by how good he was doing. He was proud, and, and tithing is giving a portion of your income. You know, he's praying right, and, you know, he is not like these people sleeping around and the sinners. He's not like the tax collector. He's not betraying his nation. And can I tell you, these people need help. They are trying to do good, but something in their heart is corrupt. They think they're better than other people. Look, look, God can work with everybody. He can work with the proud and the humble, but you don't, you don't want to fall where Jesus says, hey, man, this, this thing will trip you up. So there's some people that are doing so well, and they're looking down on people. And he said the tax collector went away right with God. Now, one thing to, to keep in mind about this tax collector he was involved in some bad stuff, and he was ashamed. So I, I just want to tell you something. If you're living a life that's creating shame, yes, we're going to change. It's called repentance. We'll talk about more of that later, but you can change. But here's, what, here's what's cool. When you feel a little hurt and you, you see the problems in your life, God will reach you there. He will come to where you are. So the, what, what really helps God help that person in sin is that person knew they were doing what's wrong and they knew they needed God's help. If you know that you're doing something wrong and you need God's help to fix that area of your life, guess what? You're in a great position to get your prayer answered. Now, recently in an American, um, I guess it's history, it happened the other day, there's a, a, a guy that killed some of his family members. And I remember watching his uh, court case online thinking, well, I hope they convict him. The, the evidence was overwhelming of his guilt. And I was really hoping that, that he wouldn't get away with this. And I, I remember watching the sentencing and the judge said, I sentence you to the rest of your natural life. I've never really been to sentencing trials. I've never watched a, crime, a criminal trial live. When I heard those words, it took my breath away, the rest of natural life. And the judge talked about, you know, these people that you killed, they're going to come see you in your mind and in your heart. And I, I basically, I hope, I hope you quit lying and tell the truth. I hope you don't lie forever and you're going to have to deal with your consequences. And besides the point of what the judge was saying, my point of saying that my, my joy that the right, uh, excuse me, the guilty was convicted at that moment when the rest of his natural life will be behind prison, I changed my prayer for that man. I said, Lord, I hope he doesn't spend the rest of his life hiding from you. I hope someday he tells the truth. So the, the reason I'm talking about this, it's really easy to say, well, I'm not like the person who killed my spouse and my son. 
oh, that, that person lies every day and steals millions of dollars and is a drug addict. If you think you aren't that uh, bad, don't think this scripture isn't talking to you. So if, look, we don't want mad Jesus. We don't want a rebuke from God, a sharp one. We don't want to, why don't we just do what he said to do? Love people, right? Let's not be the Pharisee in that prayer, just looking down on people feeling good. Let's realize where our shortcomings and our faults are. I guarantee if, if you have a family, you've got room to grow in whatever part of the family you're in. If, if you're just the, the 18-year-old brother and you got a sibling, you've got room to grow how you treat your parents, how the other authority figures in your life, and even, uh, I don't know, if you got a sister or something. So let's carry on here. Um, there's a man in the Bible. He, he was a great role model. But don't you know a lot of role models, sometimes they have a problem. It is quite interesting. Almost every single role model in the Bible, you end up seeing the part that they fell. And, you know, this guy was great, but man, when he fell, he just ran a million miles down the naughty lane. King David saw a beautiful woman and slept with her, got her pregnant, and he tried to hide that from her husband, Uriah. When Uriah wouldn't sleep with his wife, so at least he could pretend like maybe you did it, he got the man killed. This is not the best story for how a Christian should live their life. If that's your story, how you fell into sin, you slept with somebody's wife, you got their husband killed, God can restore you. He can work with you. But this isn't the kind of life that God is promoting. And the reason I'm mentioning this is Jesus, or excuse me, uh, David wrote some Psalms, and some of these Psalms, you could view them as prayers. You could sing some of them, but we're going to read one of his Psalms. And when I read the words, think about his heart. Remember, we were talking about guarding your heart vigilantly. Listen to how this man guarded his heart. And what's interesting about King David is when God talked about him through the word of God, it says that he was a man after God's own heart. So let's see what God elevated him. God ended up restoring him, but not without consequences for bad behavior. God could forgive you. That doesn't mean that uh, we'll just pretend like things didn't happen. There was real consequences, but that's a long teaching for another day, but let's go ahead right now and see what G, uh, excuse me, David was talking about. Psalm 51, 1 through 4. Have mercy on me, O God, because your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. Man, you almost have to take a deep breath after that. There was a judgment. A lot of people died from his sin. And... When you've hurt somebody and your heart hurts, Jesus can help that. But sometimes it's hard carrying that pain. And what I like about David was he, in his prayer, which we read as a psalm, he's saying, your judgment against me is just. It, there's no time to hide. Let's not pretend. Let's not blame society how we were raised. Some of our actions were rebellion. Some of that, we chose to hurt people. And even if at the moment we didn't think it was hurting them, but we still did it, at some point you got to realize when you did wrong, you did that against God. I like how in the Bible it says that men and women were made in the image of God. When we hurt somebody, whether it's our family member, a neighbor, or even somebody we don't like, like an enemy, they were made in God's image. When we attack or hurt somebody, we're taking a shot at God, and we need to be careful what we're doing. David, he prayed about it, and he, he worked on his heart. Remember guarding that wellspring of, of, your, of life, your heart? 
prayer, we're going we're gonna to guard what's in our heart. We're going to talk to God and, and ask him to help us get through life. Now, I'm going to read five other scriptures, but we're going to go through them one at a time. And I've been praying over many years, and what helps guide my prayers, uh, the scripture has taught me how to be a Christian. So I'm going to share with you five scriptures that will change your life. And if you want to grow in your prayer life by learning this scripture, you, you see some uh, intricate detail of how to relate to God, how to get your heart ready. So I'm just going to read the scripture, tell you a little few things about it, and then I'm just going to have a quick prayer in case some of you are shy. Some of you probably don't pray a lot, and if it would help you just a little bit, I'm going to take this time to pray for you. I care about you with everything I have, even as I stand in here and edit, and uh, uh, my son helps edit these videos. You are the focus of Diadem Life. We care about you, and, and all I can do, the best I can do for you, is the greatest thing that God can do for you. Is I'm just going to do my best to let you know what he's talking about. Wouldn't that be nice? Just, just I want to pray for you right now before we do those five scriptures. God, I pray for the wonderful people listening to this show right now. I pray right now that they could imagine and feel the hurt spot in their heart that needs to grow. And Lord, I thank you. You're good enough and you're big enough to help them heal that spot. Amen. Thank you for letting me pray for you. I didn't plan all that. Let's go on now to Hebrews 4, 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Now, maybe it's my attention span, but I kind of get stuck on that first sentence. Let, look at that. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. I'm telling you, I'm bold when I come to God. And we're not talking about the spiritual gifts. There's a whole lot of spiritual gifts. And there's office gifts too. And I know some Christians might think that's debatable, but uh, he, gave, he, he called some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. When I think about the gifts of healing, raising the dead, praying for the sick, discernment, all these um, wonderful promises in Scripture, I view that as a storehouse. So when I pray boldly and I go before the throne, I believe I have access to anything God has. If he had it for any human being, why can't we pray by faith to have it? Now, you might not have that faith, and you might even disagree with me, and I'll let you disagree with me, but it's okay. I care about my family with this much faith. I think God ain't going to be mad at me as long as I'm not acting nutty. So with that scripture in mind, I'm going to show you how I'd pray, but I'm going to pray for you. God, thank you so much for the people listening to this show right now. I pray that they would have some boldness in their prayer, that they'd quit being scared, that they wouldn't be scared of their own shadow, God, and Lord, there's a lot of young men that listen on YouTube. I pray that they would stand up with their shoulders back and their chest out a little bit and care about what you want to do in their family. Touch these young men, Lord. And for the men who already know what I'm talking about, I pray that they would quit giving up and quit thinking like they don't have something to give. I pray for all these fathers out there that have children. You were created for a reason and your children need you. And I pray right now for all these fathers that they would fix what is broken and that they would ask you for help and they would go embrace and hug the children that they've hurt and ask for forgiveness. Amen. Well, asking for forgiveness ain't always fun, but it's good. It will change your life. Let's do another scripture. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Some of you got a sin problem. And you might not want to talk about it. And some of you... You've been trying to hide it, but people are starting to find out. 
Now, I know what it's like to be stuck in sin. I remember being so struck in drugs, I couldn't get out. I remember wanting to do a thing and then doing what I didn't want to do. There are many things like this, and, and trust me, once you get certain things out of your life, uh, trust me, sin will find its way back. There's always something to improve on to get better at. Jesus is saying through the scriptures that he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can stand. And here's the promise that I like in this scripture. This is why it's here. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. How nice would that be? You're going through a tough time. He's promising an escape door. Now, if you go into a restaurant, the door you go in is generally the only door you see. When you're struggling with something, there is an escape door. In America, you have to have more than one door for every room. So if you go in a restaurant, there's back doors through the kitchen. Now, the back door is not always visible if you're not looking for it. So some of you are struggling in sin. You're being tempted. You got to look for the way out. Jesus promised no matter what you're going through, there's a way out. There's a door. Better start running. That's what this prayer is going to do for you. I'm going to pray for you right now. God, there's some really nice people out here. And they're not looking for the door. And some of people are praying. They feel bad. They don't like their sin. But they're not trying hard because they have low self-esteem. And they blame it on their anxiety. Lord, I pray you would give them the strength to know that you can help them in their soul. You can bring confidence. And I thank you that you're not a God who just tells us to be good. You take the time to walk with us and let us know you will not be tempted beyond what you can bear. I'll be with you and I'll provide them a place. So I pray very fervently right now, there are men and women listening right now, whether they're tempted today or tomorrow, they are going to remember this scripture. They're going to have a thought about the way out. Now my prayer is that they choose it, Lord, and if they make a mistake and don't choose it, that they don't quit. I pray that you'd help them get moving, God, and get back to their good life. Thank you, Lord. Man, how many times have you been prayed for this much? But we got two more, I think, if I can count correctly. Let's go on down to Revelations 4.8. Before I do it, I'm going to tell you right now the little, the little willy-billy uh, two-cent thought here on this. A part of praying to God is realizing how awesome he is. Sometimes you need to just praise and thanks God and, and just quit babbling about all the things that could probably take a, a, a break. God knows about your money, your clothes, your food. He knows about your situation at work and your relationship challenges, your, your maladies and diseases and infirmities. He knows all that. But sometimes when we're going to pray, we're just going to, we're just going to, Remember, we're guarding our, the wellspring of life, our heart. We're letting our heart emanate a praise to God. We're going to talk about how awesome he is. All right, let's read Revelations 4.8. This is a fabulous scripture. I'm telling you, this is, this is some shouting that's going to be going on in heaven. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and is still to come. Holy is separate. There's something about God. There's nothing like him. He is that holy, and we are going to pray to him. Here we go. God, you are awesome. There's nothing like you. You're not a weak, flimsy God. You aren't confused. You weren't scared about all the, the silly things that are happening in our lives. People are talking about artificial intelligence changing the planet. People are scared that robots are more important than human beings. People are making all kinds of decisions. They're scared about nuclear warfare, but you are not a coward. You stand firmly in history. You talk to men and women of God who've sought through, they've gone through deserts and and pain, and uh, famines, and wars, and people have carried your name. They will continue to carry your name, and no robot will ever be able to give you the glory like a man or woman of God. I pray for the people listening right now that they would know that how awesome you are, and I declare that you are good enough, and you are righteous enough 
You are worthy to be followed. There's a lot of good men and women on, on TV and everywhere they are, and there's some good people out there, but none of them is worth worship. And I pray that the people listening to this, vo the, these, the voice of the scriptures, that they, would, that they would guard their heart and make their heart look at you. God, we appreciate entertainers and you know, singers and movie people and all this and that, but we will not forget that there is nothing more awesome than you. And Lord, for some reason, as awesome as you are, you lifted up love. You lifted that over anger and hate. And I can't wait to meet you in heaven someday and ask you, because I really appreciate your love. Without it, we wouldn't have a reason to care. Thank you for, for being love and awesome. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. God loves you. You might be watching this, this film. You don't even know what year it is. It don't matter. It doesn't matter how many views, how many people like it or dislike it, whether you comment, whether you subscribe or not. This is for you. God cares about you. And believe me, there's not multi-million budgets, uh, uh, search engine optimization, throwing these things around the internet. And if you've listened this far, I can guarantee you God cares about you. Let's go to one more scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. I need you to focus for a minute. When you're in Christ, you've got a new life. The old has gone and a new life has begun. Now, here's, here's a problem. We're not really diving into this. You can be living your new life and you can resurrect what is old. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Now, some of you might be thinking, what are you talking about a new life? How can I change? I promise you God can help you have a new life. And what, what I'm saying is, some of you have been living your new life, and every once in a while, you just think, well, I got time to screw around, and you pick up some old habit that you've had or some temptation, some emotional feeling thing that you used to have. Don't do that. Don't go back to the old life. And, and there's not a lot good there, and, and I shouldn't have to convince you very much. You should know that by now. But I want you to know that God is promising you a new life in Christ. I can't wait to pray that for you. All right, here we go. This is the year these wonderful men and women will start walking in their new life. Lord, we're not praying for a New Year's Eve fad, a little one-week commitment, Lord. Lord, I want to pray for these people going through divorce right now. It's hard. There's some issues of a new life, the old life, issues from the old life. Lord, you said if we were in Christ, you'd be with us and you'd help us. Please help everyone who's going through a divorce right now. Lord, I also want to pray for those people who don't know exactly what their career is. And I, I speak peace to their heart. You speak peace to their heart through the scriptures to trust in you. And I thank you that you've got a good life plan for those that are listening right now. And I want to pray for those that, that are having career decisions. I thank you that in the, the book of Isaiah, it says you will hear a voice. Whether you go left or the right, you will hear a voice saying, this is the way walk in it. I want to pray for the people that are kind of struggling between two good decisions. I thank you that you gave them autonomy you gave them ability to make a decision and to have peace, and I pray that they wouldn't be thinking which is good or which one's better, that they would just go with faith, and you're going to go with them. I pray for all the people who struggle to think that they could ever be new. Lord, just like that tax collector, some people listening to this broadcast, their feelings are hurt because they've hurt a lot of people, and they don't think you'd love them. And you know what, God, that old life is broken. So in a sense, they're right, but they're not truly right. What you didn't like in them, you can create in them a new life. And you can like them new and fresh. They can be born again. 
Help those be born again who, who have too much depression. Amen. <laughs> I, I'm a little tired praying for you, but I'm going to keep going. I'm going to use my stamina that God gave me. I'm going to do one more prayer. Come on, let's do this one. Here we go. Ephesians 4.32. Instead, be kind to each other. Keep in mind, Christians, this is a command. It's not you should feel like it. Let's read it again. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. So let me tell you something. He said, forgive other people. He did not say, feel like forgiving. But write that on a piece of paper, write it on your board. It doesn't matter if you feel like it. Now, some of you are thinking, what are you talking about? If you knew what they did. Now, now, granted, I'm not trying to minimize your pain. The most evil and horrendous things might have happened to you. That does not excuse it. God will deal with it spiritually and in the next life. But he's telling you to forgive that person. Now, that does not mean invite that person over for dinner. That does not mean, I got five kids. If someone seriously uh, did something incredibly evil and bothered me, upset me, that doesn't mean I need to invite them over for dinner. They don't need to come in my house. And even if I loved that person who was close to me, that doesn't mean they ever get to see my family again. It just means in my heart. Remember, we got to guard our heart. It's time for you to be vigilant and not be sloppy. If you're mad at somebody and you won't give up to it, that demonic plan, that human feeling fights God. You don't want your heart going that way. You don't want to be in trouble with God. God said, forgive other people because he forgave you through Christ Jesus. He's not going to forgive you of all your pain and just let the other people suffer, languish, and die. Now, he will deal with them, I promise you, but he's not asking you to feel forgiveness. You forgive because it's right and it's the choice. And when you forgive people, they're not restored if, to all their previous uh, privileges with you. Look in society. If a murderer tells the judge, hey, I'm sorry, it's like, okay, well, I, I get it, you're sorry, but there's a law and there's a judgment against that. Maybe that's a little much for you, and maybe I preached and teach too much, so I'm just going to go ahead and pray it. I, I hope God can help you with your unforgiveness. Lord, there are some unforgiving people, and they have offended you because they're not letting their heart change, but you are very nice, God. You are full of love, and Lord, I pray these brothers and sisters, these men and women, the young men and the young women, that they can understand that forgiven people is not a feeling thing. Lord, you will resist them if they don't forgive. And I pray that their heart is smart enough to not resist you. Lord, there's a lot of pain out there. And you said when uh, you came into our lives that the Holy Spirit would come in and the Holy Spirit is a comforter. Some people need some comfort. They need to forgive first. They need to let the, let the accusers go. Be forgiven and forget about them and move on. But I pray that there, there's some healing that right now that's happening to people that are forgiven others. Wow. Thank you for letting me pray for you, but we're not done yet. I, you know, I think the theologians would probably get mad if I taught prayer without doing the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to do the Lord's Prayer. And if you don't know it, it's a great thing. Now, I got a little commentary after. Let's just get after it. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And do not let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. A lot of people quote this in probably even a different versions. And you might, if you've ever been in religious places, you might have said this. Now, Jesus did say, pray like this. So 
I think some people like literally like they just read the scripture, which you should. That that's not bad to read it. I kind of think Jesus wasn't saying just repeat this a trillion times through the the rest of the the span of the earth. I think a part of this, and and some other scholars would agree, there's a model in this prayer that you could apply to your life. So let's go back to the scripture. I'll give you a little commentary. So when it says pray like this, consider Jesus is teaching you how to pray. Let's acknowledge God and how awesome he is in the beginning. Okay, next line. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, so when you acknowledge God, realize what God wants maybe for your life, and then let's try to do that. Next, give us today the food we need. Okay, tell him your need, whatever that need is, and it could be as simple as food. And then, isn't it interesting when Jesus is impacting us how to pray, he pivots right to forgive us our sins as we forgive those. He, like He's really dynamically connected to love. He really wants society to work and not be mad at each other. So we're going to focus on, hey, is there anybody I got to forgive? Oh, by the way, oh God, forgive me for my sins. And then we're not going to yield to temptation and rescue us from the evil one. That's a model. That's not just a word. You could pray the word for word prayer, but I, I'm going to pray in, in ways uh, some other people might pray this as, as they're going through it. God, you're awesome. God, you are awesome. In heaven... There is no sickness, crying, or pain. Lord, I remember you teaching us that in, in Revelation. Lord, and I pray that comes to earth. Lord, we, we know that there's going to be pain on earth, but I pray for a great amount of healing. Some people right now might have back problems or feet problems or diabetic problems. I pray for healing through faith, through the Word of God spoken and taught. God we all need something, and I pray for the, the young men and the young women and, and, and back, actually every man and woman out there who's struggling for income. God, there's a lot of people out there who are concerned about paychecks and being behind. God, help us. Help us, please. Send help. Help us not be wasteful, too, God. There's sins out there that we've committed with money, that we, we have bought things we shouldn't. And some of them, are, they're not so bad, but, but it was foolish. I pray you'd help people save their money properly. Lord, you said beer is not for kings. There's a bunch of royalty out there. There's people out there. They might not feel royal, but you've got a new life for them. And a part of alcohol, it, it's not for royalty. I pray you'd help people out there who... They're spending money in a category. They don't need to be spending it. And I pray for people's sobriety right now in this, this time of the prayer. And Lord, a lot of us got to forgive some people. And some of us are kind of proud that we're not like such and such. But help us never be so proud that we can't help people. And according to the last focus of your prayer, that we wouldn't yield to temptation and you'd re rescue us from the evil one, Lord. There's temptations out there with our eyes and our minds and what's on TV. Lord, at the click of an internet button, extremely righteous material is available and extremely evil. Guide us, guide our eyes, guide our heart, guide what we're seeing online and protect us. Lord, the evil one is, is a demon, but really, Lord... There's so many people working against us with, with taxation and laws and how we treat our children. There, the, there's a whole world system designed to promote corruption and rot. Thank God sometimes there's good laws out there, but there's so much that helps people be hurt. Help us withstand that temptation and help one another. I want to tell you, thank you for clicking on this video. For me to be able to share with you and to pray for you, it, it's special. I feel like I got the best job in the world. I don't have to be scared to tell somebody that Jesus loves you. I get to create content for you. 20 sub years of trying to find scriptures, listening to thousands of sermons, and I'm trying to bring you the best. And I got to admit, 
I whine and complain because it's hard making a podcast. There's a lot of things. It's expensive. I left a career to be here to try to help you. But the joy I have right now thinking about some of you that might never have heard some of this, it's worth it. If I died today, and I, Lord knows I don't want to die today, I'd know that I, I was living my best life to help you. You can do this. Diadem Life wants to help. This is called biblically-based life guidance. There's a lot of life guides out there. There's a lot of people with good ideas, and they sound cool, and their, their soul might be awesome. They're, they're fun to listen to on interviews. We just want you to know what you're getting here. Biblically-based life guide. My name's William, and it's such a privilege to be with you. But if you found any value, I want to, uh, can I provoke you a little bit? Can I challenge you? I have a call to action. Let's go ahead and look at that call to action right now. This is for the committed. Come on now, you could do this. First, I want you to pray in a non-public place. Remember, Jesus said, uh, pray to me in secret. You don't need to make no spectacle. But if prayer is new to you, I want to challenge you. Hey, if you think you're awesome, I got three challenges, but you hold on. Number one, I want you to pray. And if you're new to prayer, just talk to God. If you get all confused, just say, hi, God, I'm here. Can you help me with something and uh, uh, help me not lose to the devil? Okay, that's about two sentences, three sentences. You can do that. Second, I want you to pick one of the scriptures in this teaching and spend 10 minutes praying about it. Remember now, I'm provoking you. I'm challenging you. I'm not here just to talk pretty. I want your life to change. I'm challenging you to spend 10 minutes in prayer. And if you put it on a to-do list and don't do it, guess what? You'll forget and you didn't do it, and you'll keep scrolling through some social media feed. And I guarantee you, if you spend 10 minutes with God, it's better than wherever you spend it elsewhere. Now, here's the extra credit. You ready? Come on now. I want you to share one of these scriptures with somebody and pray with them. So if you think you're hot stuff and you got all this figured out, I'm challenging you. Die dim life, God, William. I want you to share with somebody and pray with somebody. It doesn't need to be a spectacle. And look, if, if these people aren't used to prayer, I would suggest to have some decency. You might not want to go to the most sensitive topics. And if you're wondering, how would I ever do that? Just say, hey, I've been thinking about you. Can I pray for you? And a lot of people will say, well, I don't need any prayer. And just say, well, do you mind if I pray for you, though? And they, if they say yes, great. And then just say, Okay, here's what I'm going to pray. Then you pull out that scripture. Come on, man, I'm giving you the strategy here like a door-to-door -door salesman. I'm giving it to you. Have the scripture ready. Just read it real quick. Pray for him real quick. And don't worry about how impactful it is. You don't need a five-minute prayer. People that don't pray, if you show up and you pull out a scripture, you don't know if that scripture is the number one thing affecting them. You don't know. And when you pray for them, even if it was only four sentences and you leave, some of these people are going home thinking, I think there's a God. Well, yes, there's a God, but some people might not know that. God bless you. Have a great day. It's time to arise. Now is the time to stand firm in your holy royal blessing. So come on now, click another video because it's important to keep on growing.